Some say that the German general election in September is the most important election this year. I'm in front of the White House to talk with Jeffrey Rathke about the US perspective, what America expects from the next chancellor and what each party stands for. Jeffrey Rathke is the president of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at the Johns Hopkins University. Thank you so much for making time for Deutsche Welle, Jeffrey. So some say these are the most important elections this year. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. The, the Bundestag election on September 26th is the most important election happening anywhere in the world this year, in my view, because Germany is at the heart of Europe. Uh, Germany defines in many ways the direction that Europe takes, uh, and it's a crucial part of uh, the transatlantic uh, bond. So this is uh, undoubtedly going to be a major event on the political landscape. Germany has a very different system uh, than the United States. We have several parties, uh, not only two as here. Maybe you can talk a little bit why that matters. Sure. Uh, a parliamentary system in which you have uh, many parties represented, more parties now than, than ever before in, German, in recent German history. Uh, it means that any government has to be formed uh, as a coalition. Uh, nobody has an absolute majority on, uh, on his own, or, and therefore that means compromise. So it means that nobody gets exactly what they want, and it means also that people in the United States who are thinking about the imp impact on the German-American relationship have to take into account this coalition dynamic, this compromise, which is going to uh, characterize German politics in the future as it always has. What does that mean for reliability? The, the tendency in Germany to have a negotiated coalition agreement, um, it gives a certain amount of predictability. Um, and uh, I would say the problem is in some ways perhaps in the opposite direction. It, because parties in Germany, uh, when they form a government, they have a written coalition agreement, which is often dozens, uh, if not more, pages long. Um, there is a desire to try to anticipate everything. You can't anticipate everything. And so it's that, it, that can give a lack of flexibility um, to future actions, because things that are not covered in the coalition agreement then have to be hammered out um, anew. And there can be a reluctance to deviate from those agreements. So I think it's, it's more a question of um, having enough flexibility to react to the way the world is going to change, rather than predictability about what your positions are today and for the next couple of months. As you are an expert uh, on international affairs, maybe we can talk a little bit about the ex expectations of the three biggest parties. I think that the Chancellor Merkel, having been in power for 16 years, uh, there is an expectation of a certain continuity. Um, and there you see uh, from an American perspective that the Chancellor has been, uh, on the one hand, concerned about holding Europe together, the European Union especially, uh, through a number of crises. Now, uh, Germany, as the largest and the richest country in Europe, has the delicate task of trying to bring together the ambitions um, of those who want uh, more European integration and they want it faster with those who are more skeptical. And, and in that sense, Germany is a compromise broker rather than a, a, at the vanguard of new innovations. Uh, instead, it's sort of a moderating force. And I think that when you look at Europe, Armin Laschet, the chancellor candidate from the CDU-CSU, has, uh, has said that he will think European and he will act European, that he has a European instinct. And so I think that would be something to look for from a government that he might lead. Uh, how will it seek to strengthen the European level of policy making and what concessions will Germany be willing to offer its European partners in order to achieve that greater degree of cohesion? Uh, will that be on the financial or the fiscal side? Uh, will that be in foreign policy um, or will it be in other areas? As for now, it looks, as you just said, very likely that he might be the successor of uh, Angela Merkel. Talk a little bit about his take on the transatlantic relationship. Uh, if you talk about the transatlantic relationship, the CDU and CSU have always uh, tried to, to characterize themselves as, uh, as real advocates, staunch advocates of a strong transatlantic bond. Um, and that has held 
regardless of the president in power in the United States. There have been major ups and downs in the relationship, but that, uh, that real um, adherence to the transatlantic pillar um, as one of the two most important aspects of German foreign policy, on the one hand, the United States, on the other hand, the European Union, um, is, uh, is at the center of the CDU's view of the world. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about Olaf Scholz. He's from the Social uh, Democrats. They have a traditionally a closer relationship to Russia. Gerhard Schröder, one of the chancellors from the Social Democrats, was kind of the mastermind behind, behind Nord Stream 2. What, what is your take on Olaf Scholz when it comes to the German-American relationship? Mm -hmm. uh, I think Olaf Scholz, if you listen to the way he has portrayed his view of, of the world and of Germany's place in the world, uh, and if you look at the way he has uh, talked about the Biden administration, uh, I think he has sought to uh, align them quite closely, um, to, to tell German voters in a way, I know how to work with a U.S. administration under President Joe Biden. And, and I think that uh, encompasses not only some of the traditional foreign policy elements, I think we'll come back in a second to Russia and to Nord Stream 2, but it's also about the global economy. What kind of regulation should there be in the global economy? Olaf Scholz, uh, along with the United States government, um, have talked a lot about the minimum tax on uh, international co corporations. And uh, that has been achieved uh, in agreement in the G7 context, also in G20. Now it's a question of turning that into national obligations. Uh, but I think there you see an area where the Social Democrats have tried to present themselves in a way as uh, transatlanticists for the global, uh, the digitized global economy. Now when it comes to Russia, I think you're absolutely right. People in the United States who look at the Russia policies of Germany and Europe, one of the first things uh, they focus on is the North Stream 2 pipeline project. And, and I think um, you know, Chancellor Merkel, of course, has defended that project and she has seen through an agreement with the United States about how that might move forward. Um, but I think people still see that as primarily a social democratic party um, initiative and, and a priority. And there I think there's just a, a major disagreement uh, in both American parties, the Democrats and the Republicans um, are quite critical of Nord Stream 2 and, uh, and, and that stance isn't going to change. Then there are the Greens. There were times when people uh, were expecting, hoping, fearing uh, that Annalena Baerbock might become uh, the next chancellor. What I think you see from an American perspective is how strongly the values orientation comes through in the Greens foreign policy vision. Uh, you can see that when you look at questions that relate to China uh, and especially things like forced labor and the, the importance of human rights, um, including the implications of human rights policy for Germany's international economic engagement. There I think the Greens are, uh, they, they try to go much further than, than other parties in Germany uh, have gone thus far. If you look at Russia policy, I think you see also a, uh, not only a criticism of Russian foreign policy, but more fundamentally, a, um, a deep, um, uh, not only disappointment, but a, a deep um, concern about human rights in Russia, about the nature of Vladimir Putin's regime, uh, and about the implications that has for stability in Russia and Russia's role in its immediate neighborhood and more broadly in Europe and in the world. So I think there you see a values-driven alignment that is very similar to the way Joe Biden talks about the competition between democracies and autocracies as one of the defining elements of the international situation today. Do you have an idea uh, whom the Biden administration would kind of prefer? Well, I think they would be careful never to express a preference um, because you know, there's there's, there's nothing to be gained by uh, trying to weigh in in advance of an election. It can only backfire um, and be used against you. Uh, I, I think that what people in the Biden administration recognize is that any German government is going to be the result of compromise and concessions among the parties. So that's the first thing, is 
don't read the party program of one party and assume that that will, that will shape um, the Germany uh, of the future. But I think you can also look at uh, these positions and see how Germany's foreign policy might evolve. And there, uh, I think you can find um, something, you know, something for everyone. If you, on the one hand, the continuity and the transatlantic commitment in the CDU-CSU um, approach. On the other hand, the, the views of the global economy that uh, the Social Democrats uh, bring, um, or the, the, the values-driven uh, imperative of the Greens uh, uh, program. So I think people will be looking for new leadership new uh, personalities and trying to forge constructive working partnerships with whoever emerges. You know, we, also, we haven't talked about the, the, the liberals, the, the free democrats. Uh, there's also, I think, a significant likelihood that they might be part of uh, a future German government. And, and there, I think you also see, um, you know, a, you see a bit of the values uh, basis in the FDP's uh, election program. Um, and, and I think it's a reminder that this may be the mo most complicated German government that we've seen in recent history. I think we have to talk a little bit at the end of this interview about Angela Merkel after 16 years in office. That's a long period. Uh, she shaped the understanding of Germany uh, uh, for a whole generation, generation, I think, also in the United States. She's very well known. What is her legacy when it comes to the transatlantic relationship? How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say two minutes. <laughs> okay, two minutes. Um, so I, I think that Merkel's legacy is, uh, you know, it is on the one hand a commitment to preserving a working German-American uh, partnership and a transatlantic relationship. You see this in the way she took heat at the start of her chancellorship for finding ways to work closely with President George W. Bush. Um, America's popularity uh, in Germany was at a low point uh, when she took office in 2005. And so, uh, you know, it's important to remember that she has stood for a strong partnership with the United States, even when it was unpopular. Uh, I think you see that as well during the presidency of Donald Trump. Um, uh, although in that case, you see Merkel, I think, s drawing distinctions to a greater degree between uh, German policies, German disagreements with the United States, while at the same time recognizing the essential importance of that relationship. A and then uh, I think you also have to look at her um, commitment to keeping the European Union um, uh, functional and together on major issues. Uh, that, is a, a, that is hugely important for the United States as well. Uh, chaos in Europe is not good for the United States. That does not benefit us. And having someone who is able to take the long view and to foster a, a strong European Union and, and a strong European contribution to transatlantic security in NATO is really crucially important. Jeffrey, thank you so much. That shall be continued after the election and then we discuss the outcome and the implication for the US-German relationship. I look forward to it. Thanks so much, Ines.